So I'm going to show a very complementary approach to the one that, that uh, Ham just showed uh, for reading and writing genomes. And it ties in very well with, uh, I think, many of the themes in the history of this where we're actually, I'm showing two examples of how we can re-engineer the genetic code. Not me metaphorically, but actually the translational code that uh, Gobind Karana and his coworkers helped to decode and established, in a sense, the, the field of functional genomics, uh, synthetic genomics, um, back in the 60s um, by actually taking synthetic pieces of RNA and making them work on ribosomes. And I'll show you our progress on, on reconstituting ribosomes uh, in that context as well. Uh, the in vitro version of this, of changing the genetic code, and in a way of making a, a, a a mini genome, not quite a minimal genome, is, uh, is to build it up entirely from parts, from monomeric uh, nucleotides and amino acids. Uh, I don't need any slides, really. Yeah. Uh, from monomeric uh, nucleotides and amino acids to the basic polymers, DNA, RNA, and protein that we, that we associate with the, with the replicating system and making it uh, make copies of itself. And then the alternative, so, so that's, that's something where we know the complete three-dimensional structure of all the components, we're making it from monomers, it's really as close to synthetic as we're going to be for a while. At the other extreme is being able to reprogram valuable uh, uh, whole organisms that are basically already running. Um, in, in the way that Ham ended his talk, where yeast is a very easily manipulable uh, organism and E. coli is another one just like it, and Jay Kiesling showed this as well. So, um, um, so when we, when we uh, are engineering these, these systems, we, want, we wanted to, uh, we're aiming for, for uh, systems that replicate very quickly. They have high efficiency they, of whether your goal is to make um, specialty chemicals or make bio, uh, biological fuels or pharmaceuticals, as, as, as Jay pointed out. Yeah, that's okay. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, my slides are actually on a, on a vanilla PC. They work on every kind of computer, so I, but, but I appreciate the, the help here. It's very good. Um, so, so what we do is uh, start with a, um, with a, um, I. Maybe I do need slides, yeah. <laughs> Would you like to use my computer? Okay. Take anything. Thank you. Okay. So I want to thank all these uh, uh, organizations uh, that have helped us turn this into something uh, valuable. And uh, this is also my conflict of interest slide. So <laughs> you really can't believe anything I say. Um,
a spinning molecules uh, transfer RNA, which I saw as a crystallographer, and this is the impact that uh, Kron has had on me, mostly indirectly. In 1971, he invented PCR. He did not get the Nobel Prize for that. Uh, and this is a quote from his JMB paper, he and his colleagues. Uh, and I, I definitely read it and, uh, and, and uh, didn't do much about it until years later, but everything I've done since then is dependent on it. And uh, when I showed up as a graduate student in Cambridge in 77, I went to his lab to talk about DNA nanostructures. I'm not going to talk about that because William Shee and Ned Seaman are going to talk about that tomorrow. And then, but to put in perspective why DNA nanostructures and to some extent PCR were not really feasible in that, when I showed up as a graduate student was that uh, synthetic primers were still expensive in every lab other than uh, Govan Karana's lab. Uh, and I'll show you that in the next slide. Um, where this is when we fi I finally, our lab worked up the enthusiasm for actually ordering an oligonucleotide. And uh, two of them, 10 long, and they were $6,000 each. Um, and this was collaborative research who, who I c continued to work with for many decades after that, uh, doing synthesis and sequencing of various sorts. We've improved by seven logs in writing DNA, and we've improved in seven logs in reading DNA since then, and I'll give you some illustrations. So, this, so I participated in the first generation of reading and writing, and this is the second generation. It's based on same, same way, it's based on synthesis and sequencing on chips, or basically flat glass surfaces for the most part. And here's four, five of the companies that I've worked with on, on various ways of synthesizing DNA on chips. And we can now make up to 60, even 160 million base pairs of raw DNA on chips sort of in the less than $1,000 range. That's raw DNA, and I'll emphasize that in, in the next slide. And these four, five different ways of doing it range from inkjet to uh, standard chemicals. Um, and then illustrated here is a micromirror device, which uh, Franco Serena, who uh, did a lot of this work here at Madison and, and is a close friend and colleague, um, championed it at, at Nimblegen and it's, and it's key to many things that we're going to be doing in the future. And then uh, with Joe Jacobson and Paul Modrick and, and others have developed, and we have developed ways of doing error correction. So this is the second generation uh, DNA synthesis. And in a way, the first fusion of these that I experienced was when I started as a graduate student, Greg Sutcliffe and I did some of the DNA sequencing of the first synthetic chromosome, which happened to be the first plasmid. And it was uh, what everybody used for recombinant DNA, and it's still present in most recombinant DNA vectors, which is PBR322. And if we had continued, if we had done, Greg and I, were, were, we, 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 uh, we worked for food, but still it would have been $60 billion to sequence the human genome as efficient as Greg and I were at the time. Um, needless to say, that's changed by more than seven logs. And, and we followed a Moore's Law curve from the 70s <clears throat> all the way until uh, four years ago. Uh, which is pretty steep uh, exponential. That's a logarithmic plot on the on the y-axis, but it sped up to ten times uh, a tenfold improvement per year for second generation sequencing, and to some extent for DNA synthesis of raw oligos. But the key thing that's missing here is that uh, the blue line is gene synthesis, which Ham uh, pointed out came down in price, but not at this me meteoric rate. And it's been limited because almost all gene synthesis is still using first generation sequencing and first generation synthesis, slightly scaled up and commoditized. But it's still, it's, it's, there's this big four law gap which we hope to, to bridge in, in getting from raw DNA to genes and genomes. Uh, there's a lot of different contributions to second gener uh, generation sequencing. In particular, uh, Rade Dramonic in 91 published a non-gel based sequencing method where he did 100 base pairs, sequencing by hybridization, and many of these other things. Now, I'll be thanking my postdocs and graduate students uh, in pictures as we go along here, but very grateful to them. Uh, and there, these are, uh, 18 of my favorite companies on ultra low cost sequencing. And I'm just going to, uh, these range from electron microscopy, which is getting, uh, coming back uh, into vogue, 
and the pollinator is just the one I'm going to illustrate because it's most relevant to synth synthetic genomics. And it happens to be the only of those eight, 18 which is open access hardware, software, and wetware. And the question is, why do we care? And we have precedents for open architectures like the IBM PC, which was somewhat useful, um, and Wikipedia, which some people use occasionally, uh, and so forth, uh, Google Maps and whatnot. And this is a... Uh, this instrument is about four times less expensive, uh, and, it, and it has very high throughput, two billion reads per run, and it handles both polymerase and ligase chemistry. And you could think of those as both sequencing by synthesis. The synthesis keeps, uh, and, and reading and writing keep in, interacting with one another. And the reason it's important to have this open access, I think, it's an experiment, we won't, we won't really know until for a while, but this allows us to, allows the entire community to hot rod, to, to modify the instrument. We don't say, we don't threaten them with legal action or avoiding the warranty or anything like that. We say, please open up the device, this, this thing here, uh, which is inside the blue box, and, and change it. And so one of the first things that we're changing is we're putting in digital micromirrors, just like the one that I mentioned that Franco Sereno used at Nimblegen, so that we can now do selective release of, of individual clonal, um, molecular clones. You remember, we have billions of these in the flow cell. And the micromirror will allow us to uh, selectively release with uh, sort of photolabile uh, nitrobenzyl chemistry or other photolabile chemistry. It also allows us to do cell sorting, where we can use mo more than just the small number of colors, and we can do sorting on cell behavior or cell morphology and things that are hard to do in a conventional sorter. The important thing is that a $5,000 addition to a $170,000 sequencer suddenly makes it uh, a general laboratory tool. Now, these, are, these two stories, one is protein synthesis, and this was pioneered by uh, Nomura, who's, who you've already seen uh, talking here, and, and other groups. And most of the problem with it, uh, it's been great for reconstituting ribosomes, but typically not under physiological conditions. So you typically have uh, multiple temperatures and magnesium concentrations, and they're not conditions that are compatible with protein synthesis. And we wanted to fix that, and we wanted to make synthetic components. There's 57 different molecules that go into making up the large and the small subunit. And we wanted to be able to make them under conditions um, where we can optimize translation. Why do we want to do this? We want to improve in vitro translation because there's 10 companies that, that, do the, that we all use. You can use it for ribosome display where you can get selection without cells. You can do uh, membrane proteins more, more easily than you can in many uh, living systems. Uh, you can make personal vaccines. You can label one protein without labeling the whole cell. And, and the one in the one that I'll emphasize is you can use new amino acids and polymers, and I'll give, illustrate this with making mirror chirality, which we haven't done yet, but we're very excited about. And the idea about mirror chirality is you have uh, normal right-handed bDNA on the left here with a, with a polymerase doing PCR, and then the mirror DNA will only be recognized with the mirror polymerase, and they don't cross-talk. And hence, if you make a mirror world, it will be resistant to the normal enzymes and will be um, uh, almost everything in the, in the, almost all the polymers in the cell um, are only degraded or metabolized by, uh, by the chiral enzymes. And we think there are at least two things that need to be done in addition to reconstituting the entire ribosomal synthesis, uh, which we'll get back to. And that is to, to change the peptidyl transferase center so it will accept mirror amino acids, which it currently discriminates against. There's been a little bit of effort here in 2003, 2006 from the HEC lab. And the second thing we need is to charge the amino acids, the mirror amino acids on the tRNA in the lower right there, uh, which this uh, Hiro Suga's lab has, has produced a general amino acid tRNA synthetase, which is based on a ribozyme, which is only 46 nucleotides long. This is all for an in vitro system. You can charge up the tRNAs in advance. So that we think that these two things plus an in vitro system for the ribosome will work. Now, if these, these we think, I'm going to show you all the genes, products that we think is necessary for replicating DNA, RNA, and proteins. This is done in the genetic 
code format, the 20 amino acids and the two stop codons indicated here by release factors one and two. Proteins are in purple and the, R, the, R, the tRNAs here are in red. And to fill out, so this is just the tRNA amino acid tRNA synthetases and the release factors. And this is a mini genome, which we mean is meant, yeah, thank you for bringing down the lights. Um, it's it's minimal geno, mini genome, but not minimal in the sense that we add a few extra proteins that we think will add, capture the high speed and high accuracy that we have in E. coli. So it's E. coli based, so we want a 20 minute doubling time at least um, uh, for this system. And so the ribosome is there on the far right, the, the large thing with the red ribosomal RNAs and um, in the middle are all the tRNAs and their synthetases. Then we have the elongation factors and, um, uh, and initiation factors in the lower left. And you get the idea there's 113 kilobase pairs of DNA and 151 genes. And we've made all of these uh, synthetically. They're all his tagged and you can purify them. The crystallographic structures are known. So we're not there yet, but we're, um, we're in moving forward. And the key thing that we, we felt that, that was missing was being able to reconstitute the ribosomes under physiological conditions. And, uh, and Mike Jewett, postdoc in the lab, um, recently did this both with um, uh, normal ribosomal RNA, so basically taking the proteins and RNA apart and putting them back together again, um, and then using uh, protein synthesis, not, not poly-U or some other surrogate, which is typically what's used uh, in the ribosome reconstitution field, but actually a, a, a large messenger RNA for protein synthesis. And here uh, in the, in the, on the left is reconstituted 50S is underlined R50S, very comparable to the, the, the orange, very comparable to the green, which is control um, non-reconstituted um, subunits and we basically go straight from the reconstitution into the protein synthesis without changing it. Um, on the far right is doing the same thing now with synthetic ribosomal RNA made with T7 RNA polymerase um, and put into uh, these in vitro um, protein synthesis systems. And then, the, and then the same thing for in vitro transcribed 16S in the, in the, at the bottom there. So we've made uh, all the ribosomal RNA synthetically. We've shown that these reconstituted ribosomes can make uh, protein synthesis. Now I just want to last, the second topic is um, moving from that in vitro protein synthesis system where we, cha we can change the genetic code and make hopefully mirror uh, proteins to in vivo engineering. And part of what we're doing is we're harvesting uh, enzymes from the wild, and, uh, and uh, Dr. Landick pointed out the, the issues with getting lignocellulose uh, uh, degradation products, which are toxic. We, isolated, we went to isolate from the environment uh, bacteria that would be re, uh, able to handle lignocellulose and the lignin breakdown products, and we did as a control antibiotic resistance, figuring that would be of lower abundance in the soil. Uh, and we're surprised to find many, this is a phylogenetic tree of all the different organisms we looked at, um, and we were surprised to find that many of these organisms would, would uh, not only survive the antibiotics, 18 different classes of antibiotics, um, all in one organism, but would actually could subsist on them as, as their sole source of carbon. Um, this was surprising, and then the, the, that was in science, and we have a follow-up coming out soon in science showing the same phenomena occurs in, uh, in humans. And moreover, in this new paper, uh, we, we weren't satisfied with just showing that, that the, the organisms were multi-drug resistant, but actually cloning out the, the, the genes and sequencing them from cult cultured and uncultured uh, organisms. And you can see the uncultured ha has uh, a lot of new genes. Um, and we hope to, uh, to expand our knowledge of what can cause uh, multi-antibiotic resistance by looking at these 2KB sequence clones. Now, so that's one s source of degrading uh, the, the biomass um, in order to feed it into biofuel options that, that uh, Dr. Zlandic and uh, Kiesling have already laid out. Uh, in particular, we want uh, uh, these fuels which are compatible with current engines and that don't require distillation that float to the top of, uh, of 
of the uh, production. And as we start to scale up these, these, and they fall into two basic classes, this has gone way, all the way out of academia. These are, again, some companies I'm um, involved in. They either go from plants in the uh, top, or they, go from the, or they actually do the photosynthesis uh, in the same organisms that are making the fuel. Um, and you can see here scaling up pilot plants uh, of some of these um, uh, production lines. And a, a very good success story is DuPont making 1,3-propane diol at the 2 million liter scale. Um, this took them about seven years and $4 million, but it, but it, it result was a, a process that was 90% of the theoretical yield from glucose to make this uh, a monomer that's used in making plastic polymers. It involved 27 changes um, in E. coli, including introducing yeast uh, and Klebsiella genes. Now, there are four genome engineering strategies. Uh, the first one we, we, uh, was introduced in, in 1979, 1997, and it's still actually quite popular, despite the fact of being displaced by other methods, because it's open access, meaning that, that uh, commercial and, and academics can use it without looking over their shoulder or paying money. Um, even though it's not, I don't think it's quite as good as a double strand linear, um, double strand brake repair. So that's, so the, number one is double strand circle to circle, double strand linear to circle. Number three is the one I'll emphasize is a single strand of 90 mer integrated with double strand circle. You get, in red are, are the pieces of DNA you're introducing. And the fourth one is conjugation, uh, where we can introduce up to a whole genome uh, by, by mating which is actually a very ancient uh, method back in the 60s and 70s for E. coli uh, genetics. And we use number three and four mainly. Uh, so this one that works really eff effectively, and, and it just came out a couple days ago in Nature, uh, Harris Wang and, and Farron Isaacs. Um, we introduced the red uh, synthetic oligonucleotide, and this requires two changes to the strain. One is the, a single strand binding protein um, that escorts the, the oligo to the, to the uh, lagging strand uh, of the replication fork, and then a mutas that uh, prevents that mismatch from being repaired. Normally, you, you would favor the old strand and get rid of the, the new, and that's not what we want. And we've optimized the, 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 the various parameters, including we protect the end with phosphothiolated bases, and, and in sector B there, uh, we show that, uh, that uh, secondary structure, you can have a computer-aided design that avoids secondary structure. This has been turned into an instrument, and we're making copies of this instrument for uh, some early adopters. Call it Multiplex Automated Genome Engineering, or MAGE. Uh, it has a three-hour cycle time where you introduce uh, a, a group of oligos, as many oligos as you want, really, and it will put them in at about 30% efficiency per cycle on average. We've seen as many as eight changes uh, simultaneously in one cell in a two-hour, two-and-a-half-hour cycle. Um, that, that's all without selection precise single point mutations or a variety of, of, of deletions up to uh, 40 KB. It's very efficient. Uh, and I'm going to illustrate it with two goals. One is uh, where you have a single goal, and the other is where you don't really know what you're doing, and it's a combinatorial optimization, kind of what Jay was talking about, where you want to optimize metabolic engineering. The single, the illustrate the single goal, we wanted to engineer in 314 changes. Remember, 27 changes is what DuPont did. We, we decided to do 314 changes to make multivirus resistance um, because that's something that might improve uh, process yield. Uh, whenever a virus or phage gets into your, your processing, it, it really messes you up for a couple of months. And so we looked at, at First, just phage scop codons. These are TAGs. They're, these are sorted by the number of TAGs. And you can see when you start getting up to the T evens, you get many, many of these TAGs used, um, and, it, and it goes up with the uh, size of the genome. And so we looked at the genetic code of, uh, of E. coli, and this is the, the standard code with the numbers next to them are the number of uh, codons that are actually found in the proteins that are used in E. coli. And, the, and it happens that the famous amber codon is used only 314 times. It's the least frequently used one, so the easiest one to change. Still not easy. Um, and we've made all 314 of those changes now. I'm happy to say that's Farron Isaacs who led this 
led our team. We did this with Joe Jacobs and, uh, and Peter Carr as well. And, uh, and so now we're coalescing those 314 changes in a diagram very similar to Ham's, but very different in what we're actually doing, where you bring together, we, we actually introduced changes throughout the, into 32 different E. coli genomes, and then by conjugation, we're bringing them in, first one and two together, three and four, and then bringing one, two, three, four together. And we're, we've got it down from 32 original strains down uh, to about a dozen strains right now, and, and we were getting close to a single strain. So the second uh, example and last uh, is, has to do with evolution where you, where you uh, th th most of these were done by spontaneous uh, evolution, two of them from my group, one for alcohol resistance, one for tryptophan and tyrosine synthesis and exchange. But, but better than spontaneous is directed, and you've seen this MAGE device is capable of doing directed synthesis, so we wanted to be able to accelerate lab evolution. And this is the, basically the last slide. Uh, and this just came out, uh, Nature's, so you can take a look at it. And what we did is we put, we engineered the ribosome binding sites of, of uh, 24 genes. Some of them had to go up, some had to go down. And we just targeted the entire pathway for lycopene biosynthesis. This was suggested to us by, uh, that we should target this by Jay uh, Kiesling, and he provided us with a plasma that, that made E. coli sort of make lycopene. And then we got it from sort of making lycopene on the far left to basically the highest levels of lycopene that have, that have ever been seen uh, in, in three days um, by running the mage with lots of combinations of ribosome uh, binding sites uh, scattered through the entire pathway. And you can see for each of these bars with the uh, lycopene production, the kinds of mutations that we were seeing. So just in, uh, in finishing here, uh, we've been talking about this incredible exponential in DNA reading and writing, but haven't yet put them together, and that's what we're going to try to do over the next year or so. Um, we use computer-aided design for this accelerated evolution um, aimed at metabolic engineering of chemical fuels and drugs. We are working on a mini-genome, not a minimal genome, which is, has about 151 genes right now. That could change. We're not there yet, um, which has the potential for making mirror um, polymers, but not there yet. Uh, and this integration we talked about, the, the mage, um, chromosome transfer by conjugation, we've dusted off an old method there. And resistance, I, I mentioned multi-drug resistance, which we discovered and we're, we're uh, exploring further, multivirus resistant we're aiming for, and multi-enzyme resistance. And I didn't mention, but I'm certainly uh, very excited about um, reading, and we, we are working, the next thing we're doing uh, with MAGE is uh, human genomes and we have modest levels, not quite as remarkable levels of reprogramming point mutations there. And, uh, and then the reading part is personalgenomes.org and if any of you want to volunteer, that would be great. Period, full stop. Thank you. <laughs>